All right, well, this is a great group, and we've talked about a lot of, a lot of key trends uh, to here today at the summit. One thing we have not gotten into, and, and I wanted to start with you, Eric, if I, if I could, is the whole notion of, of commercial space and the Seattle region in particular. This one, when John and I talk to, to groups about what's going on in the, the Seattle region, one of the, the amazing things that we see is this confluence of the two core drivers historically of the Seattle region's economy, and, and that is aerospace and software in the form of commercial space. And Eric, you're actually involved in this in a, a number of ways, so many ways that sometimes it's hard to keep track. What, uh, to what extent will the commercial space industry be regional? In other words, a competition among regions of the world or regions of the US? And if so, how is the Seattle region positioned to make this our, our next big industry? Great, great question. So um, first let me just mention a, a brief thing about commercial space anyway. So as a general topic, uh, what, what's really important is to realize that we are just at the beginning of the true commercialization of space. Uh, the first person who ever went to space was um, Yuri Gagarin. That was April of 1961. And then, of course, Neil Armstrong landed on the moon in, on July 20th, 1969. And it was only eight years between those events. And so humanity went from having no one in space to having landed on the moon in a very short period of time. But it wasn't uh, until just the early 2000s that commercial activities in space started to really uh, outpace government activities in space. And so um, we're now at the point uh, where there is much commercial activity for human space flight, for deep space exploration, and its goal is really nothing less than making humanity a multi-planetary species. And uh, so my friend Elon Musk talks about that, and, and uh, it's a big deal. I mean, that is what, that, when that happens, when we have self-sustaining uh, colonies off of the Earth, that is one of the great things that life will have achieved. And uh, as far as Seattle, uh, this is a great place for commercial space. I mean, we have uh, Jeff Bezos, Blue Origin, we have Planetary Resources, which is the billionaire-backed asteroid mining company. Um, obviously, the, the, the great background in aerospace, uh, and more and more of the, of the problems of, of, of space exploration are being solved by software. And it's, it's a super place. I mean, I think the West Coast in general is a great place for commercial space. But uh, yeah, I'm very bullish on, on Seattle and the, and the area for, for that. Now, Jeremy, you pay a lot of attention to regional economic trends uh, in your role in, in, in the past, especially with the Technology Alliance. You study these things and actually deliver what's become an annual report uh, on these trends. Now you're at, the, you're at Snoopy, uh, which is a wireless technology company working on home sensors in particular. What's it been like for you becoming an entrepreneur again in that way? And in what ways have you learned uh, about the region's economic competitiveness from your recent experience? Well, it's actually been great. I love this part. Uh, I always enjoy the first <clears throat> few years of every enterprise I get involved in. It's just the most exciting time when you build something out of nothing and then try to scale it. So uh, what have I learned? I I've learned that it's all about talent, and it's all about a place for talent to collide and bump up against other people and find things that they maybe didn't think they had in common, but they do. And from those collisions, I think, come a lot of ideas. And so I think it's really important that um, as a city, we continue to pull in a lot of talent. Uh, I'm you know, at the federal level. It's, a lot of it's about uh, immigration policy and such. Uh, at the state level, it's, it's about funding our universities and pulling people into those. And, and at the city level, it's about zoning the dirt around universities and in different parts of the city so that, that clusters of, of uh, cheap real estate uh, exist and companies can come in there and, and, and locate side by side. Th those are the things that I've learned that, that really drive an innovation cluster. So how well is Seattle doing in the Pacific Northwest by those measures? We do well in some areas. Uh, we have a lot of software. Um, we have a lot of medical devices. 
we have a small amount of biotech, probably less than we would like to have by a long shot. We don't have a big anchor tenant here uh, like we do in software, for example. Uh, the company that I'm involved with, which is a consumer device coupled with web services, we actually don't have a lot of that either. There's, there's not a lot of consumer devices in the city. Yeah. Yeah. So, Peter, you are in an, an exceptional position. Uh, you lead you know, more than 1,000 engineers as the worldwide leader of Microsoft Research. It's one of the most unique positions in technology, I would have to say. And through that lens, you have a, a really interesting perspective on technology at large. If you look out two, three years, what's the thing, what, what's the one trend, the one technology that, that just gets you excited and makes you say, hey, that's where, that's where we're headed, that's the future? Wow, that's, uh, there's just so much. And it's, uh, by the way, it's just great to be here. And I'll take a ride uh, whenever you're offering. <laughs> Perfect. I, um, you know, I think the thing that's sort of top of mind for me right now is uh, kind of a resurgence of optimism and hope in some of the hardest and most longstanding problems in artificial intelligence. You know, um, I love the kind of historical sweep here. I, I remember back in um, 1991, uh, DARPA, the Blue Sky Research Agency uh, for the Defense Department, and I, I had a stint there. In 91, the agency was responsible for about 95% of the research funding in AI, and they decided it was not never going to work, and they cut it all off. And that, that set off what in academia is now um, referred to as the AI winter. And People gave up hope that we could actually have intelligent machines that could see and hear and understand like humans, or even better. What I've seen now over the last two or three years, and looking ahead to the next two or three years, is just a resurgence of optimism and, and hope and belief that we can actually knock down these problems. And so there have been some incredible advances, making use of big data, and massive amounts of computing power that have just revolutionized how computers parse speech, understand language, see objects and photographs and videos. And these things just are starting to get deployed and I think they'll form the foundation of machines that are just embedded everywhere where you stop having to think about operating a computer and instead the computation all around you just anticipates your needs and acts on your behalf. Uh, that's, that's great. And Vern, this actually plays very strongly into to what your company is doing. Kymeta is creating broadband satellite receivers that are much more efficient and uh, less expensive than traditional phased array satellite antennas. And these antennas actually can steer beams to satellites. So in other words, you're able to get wireless connectivity everywhere. And so in some ways, it's, it's powering this world that, that Peter is talking about. But more importantly, you're fine. Just More importantly, it's powered by much of what we just discussed. So these are software-defined antennas that leverage the arc of the last 25 years of development in so many sectors, whether it's material sciences or AI. We have an antenna that has to know where is the satellite that we're going to talk to. It has to know what is its position, what's its proprioception, where is that satellite, how do I steer to it? As I go bouncing down the road, how do I steer to it really quickly as I hit a pothole and the thing has to stay connected without interfering. These are extraordinarily difficult things to do that five, 10 years ago, we didn't have enough MIPS cheap enough to make these types of things reality. In the economic side, I think what we represent, um, we've spun out of intellectual ventures a year and a week ago. We are now, went from five people to 70 people in a year. We are hiring on a trajectory that uh, is a, uh, probably a first, I think, in the last decade. Big science, heavy metal, hard, long-term projects that take patient capital. And I think the type of success we're enjoying, enjoying in this region is only because we're in this region. Yeah. Vern, you mentioned intellectual ventures, and I actually got a chance to ask you a, a version of this question on our radio show this past weekend. Um, obviously, intellectual ventures is controversial. There are some in the tech industry who like what they're doing with uh, a lot of their innovation, and you're an example of that innovation through the, the spin out of Kymeta. There are also, there's also much controversy over patents in, in the technology industry. So let me just ask each of you um, patents, 
are they enabling the innovation? Are they getting us there in two, three years? Or are they limiting where we should be as a technology industry? And, and what, what should be fixed? Vern, do you want to jump in there? The answer is yes. <laughs> I, I, all I of those things. All of those things. And you know, intellectual property comes in so many different flavors. You know, much of what we're doing um, leverages the work um, of a, a wide range of innovators over many, many years. And let me stop you for just a second. Would you mind, guys, are we having a hard time with the mic there? Could, could you, would you guys mind sharing a, sharing a mic there? I want to make sure Vern can be heard here. So we're leveraging intellectual property created by a wide range of innovators over many years that was acquired by intellectual ventures um, at a time when no one in their right mind would have paid a dime for a metamaterial patents. But on the back end of a patient assimilation of leading edge things, and then the investment of patient capital to allow Dr. Nathan Kuntz, our founder and CTO, to work in the labs for a year and a half to find ways to commercialize what had been largely purely science research projects and come up with practical product applications. But for that uh, upside that would be available from that patent protection, um, uh, this would have never happened. Yeah. Jeremy, how do you view this, just well, coming back I, into the entrepreneurial yeah, world? No, I think the patent system is um, a good idea, not particularly well implemented. I mean, I think there's certainly a lot of problems with uh, the quality of examiners and the difficulty of, of getting a good patent patented and of uh, seeing crappy ones get patented. Um, but, you know, it's a system we have, and you just, you just have to learn to live with it. So I don't really have a problem with it. I wish it was more efficient. I wish it was a little bit uh, better, uh, more discriminating between uh, what should be patentable and what isn't. And of course, that's a, a matter of judgment to a large degree. And of course, there's going to be issues with that. Yeah. D does this play into the commercial space race at all in terms of the, the intellectual property that the companies you're running or that others are, are running? We don't hear much about patents in that space. It, it does. And just to, just to give a short answer, uh, it depends. Um, some of the commercial space companies and other companies that I'm involved with have you know, a wide portfolio of patents. And uh, for example, SpaceX, with, uh, with which many of you are familiar, that's Elon's uh, space company, um, they don't really do patents. They just keep it proprietary. And it uh, doesn't mean they don't have intellectual property, of course, but they choose not to share it, even under patent protection. And that's because, in their estimation, uh, their biggest competitors they see as, as international. And uh, there's less enforceability and more of a risk of, of, uh, of those folks just figuring stuff out from the patents. So they, they choose not to. Yeah. Depends. Yeah. yeah, please do. Yeah, I think right one, that's one of the differences between uh, technology that is developed in-house and used in-house as opposed to technology that maybe is done at a university setting or something like that and, and has to go outside for commercialization because you don't really want the professors leaving and starting companies. It, you see it once in a while, but actually academics are academics because they like being academics. So there has to be a way to transfer the value associated with that work that we paid for largely because it's taxpayer money that developed those, those uh, that paid for the grants in the first place that developed the technology. So, I mean, it's, there's a big difference between uh, patents uh, as a vector of uh, getting value back to the original uh, inventor of that as opposed to just you know intellectual property that's kept inside and as a proprietary secret. If there is a reason for patents, I guess I'm saying. Yeah, I, uh, one point I'd like to make is that uh, one thing that has swept over the IT industry over the past five or 10 years is the idea that secrecy is business imperative and secrecy is cool. And I think uh, you know, Apple and Steve Jobs had a lot to do with that, but I think it would have happened anyway. And I, on balance, I think what's important about patents is that it does give some incentive and some mechanism for public disclosure of good ideas. And if we think broadly about the health of the IT industry, that's absolutely crucial because getting ideas out there, getting people to think about new ideas, um, and giving a mechanism for doing that, which is what our patent system allows us to do, helps keep the IT industry moving forward. If, if we all just went total dark, um, I don't know if we'd be making as much progress. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Apple and, and, and their, their innovations. Um, one thing that was fascinating to me this past week that didn't get a lot of attention in the iPhone 5S announcement, perhaps as much as the colors of the iPhone 5C, was the fingerprint reader. 
and, and just the fact that they were eliminating a manual step and creating much more of a natural user interface uh, by simply allowing you to press your finger onto the, the home button. And it seemed to me a first step, or at least another step, towards a future where computing is, is invisible. It's not us typing into a keyboard anymore. It's us actually gestures and, and using things that are biometric. I'm wondering, to what extent are, are each of you seeing that today? And, and how, how soon might we get to a world where we're actually able to just interact naturally, just completely naturally with, with machines? How, how far off is that? I, I think um, it's one of these things that's going to happen much faster than we think. It's going to feel slower because it's sort of like watching your grass grow. And we'll just wake up one day and realize, wait a minute, I don't even care where the computing is happening. I don't care uh, about how or what mode I'm using to interact with, with all the intelligence around me. It's just going to be there. And it's one of these things that is just being worked so hard throughout uh, certainly Microsoft, Microsoft research, but I think industry-wide. Yeah. To what extent are you seeing this? And actually, yeah. Jeremy, could you give us a level set? You're working with uh, Shwetak Patel, yeah. a real innovator, um, MacArthur Fellow out of the UW. It, explain, just as a, a grounding, what, what Snoopy is and what you're doing. Oh, sure. Okay, so Snoopy is an acronym. It stands for Sensor Network Utilizing Powerline Infrastructure, and it's a different wireless system. Uh, it's, you know, you could think it's kind of like anti-Wi-Fi, I guess. It, uh, serves the same purpose of, move, of, of getting signals from uh, wireless re, uh, transmitters to a receiver, but it uses a method of uh, coupling to all the wiring in your house, all the electrical wiring. So consequently, it uses way less power. So the batteries, you can run these sensors on, uh, on a coin cell battery for 10 or more years. Uh, and it has great range. You can put a sensor inside a refrigerator, which of course a Wi-Fi or a Bluetooth is never going to work inside a fridge so, or under a big appliance. So we're developing a sensor network meant to um, uh, help you understand what's going on in your house. And there's all kinds of sensors that could be loaded on this platform. They're all low bandwidth sensors. This is, we're not talking about streaming video or anything like that. We're talking about sensing uh, leaks and, and motion and noise and air quality and stuff like that. But uh, that's what we're doing. And, and I think to get back to the question that you asked, uh, when will computing be just sort of around us and easy and natural? I think it starts with things like sensors and how you set them up. Uh, and you know, then we go on to harder problems. Uh, we have spent, I, I gotta tell you, six months before I hired the first employee, I hired an, a product designer to work with me to mock up the setup process for installing sensors in the house. And we've done usability testing longer and put more effort into that than anything else we've done because what makes products successful for the broader market, not the hobbyist, not the hacker market, not the, not the Indiegogo um, Kickstarter market, but the broader market is that it just works out of the box. And we're getting to the point now with technology where you can do some really sophisticated things. I mean, our stuff is really sophisticated. A lot of stuff going on in the communication platform, a lot of stuff going on in the cloud, but it's got to look really simple. And I think it starts there, and then you start tackling harder and harder problems over time. And next thing you know, everything just works amazing. Yeah. Eric, to, to what extent do these trends play into to what you're doing at Intentional Software? And, and can you explain what you're doing at Intentional Software? I've actually heard Charles explain it, and I, I get it for about 30 seconds, and then I have a hard time explaining it to somebody else. It's some pretty high-level stuff that you guys are involved in. So let me break that question down. Yes, uh, First of all, questions. the future of the way computers uh, and humans interact is all about, that is what we are aiming for and, and in that space at Intentional Software. Um, the, the premise of Intentional Software is really one uh, we call knowledge processing. It is uh, making um, the user of a computer able to create electronic work products, whether they're documents or even software applications, without having to learn how to speak the language of computers in terms of code. So it basically is uh, creating, on a technical level, it's we have a, a, an application that is a development environment where we can create domain-specific languages uh, that allow subject matter experts to create their own applications. What that means in English <laughs> is that 
you can write software without learning to write code. What's, a, what's an example of one that... that so an example would be uh, we create a, a, um, an environment where a lawyer can create an automated process for drafting contracts. I mean, how many times do you have a, a non-disclosure agreement and, you know, you pay some lawyer to, to do it or, you know, it's really, there's just a few parameters that change and why can't that person uh, write in their own language what they want the computer to do? Why do they have to go to a development team for something like that? Similarly with doctors and engineers and, and everything else. So while I completely agree with uh, my good friend Hadi's premise on code.org, many, many more people need to learn to code. At the same time, what we're trying to do is instead of learning the language of computers, we're trying to create language, we're trying to create an environment where computers speak the language of people. And that is a, a much broader and better way to get, uh, to get the maximum value out of, out of the computers. That's good. So on this theme of invisible computing, where do you see this headed? Vern, you've, you've been in the wireless industry for, for a long time, and it, it seems like we're on the cusp of a lot of the things that many of your ventures were aiming for, for, for decades in a lot of ways. Where are we headed? P paint a picture for us here based on your experience. Well, as I can say about myself is I've seldom been wrong, but often too early, and sometimes way too early. Um, but to answer the question, I, I find it fascinating. Everybody in this room, I believe, minus the last panel, are all immigrants to the digital nation. And the digital natives, uh, I have a two-year-old grandson, and what that kid can do with an iPad is unbelievable. <laughs> this, this new generation is seamlessly born into this digital era, and they are already seamlessly interconnecting and in, in their lives with the tools they have today and the cognizance they have at a very young age. I think as we see um, the personal area network, you know, I think a decade ago we started talking about, you know, WANs, MANs, LANs, and PANs, and, you know, yeah, it's starting to happen, and so now we've got a whole bunch of uh, human body sensors for how do we feel, what are we doing, how's our health doing, all these things that are, um, you know, new innovations that are on threads that have been worked on for 25 years um, are, are starting to allow we, the new immigrants, to more easily play in this nation that we're navigating into, I think. Yeah, that's great. Just a reminder, if you do have questions, just tweet them to GW Summit. I want to go into some things like Google Glass here in just a second and get, get the panel's thoughts on that. I think John will also be walking around and, and get your thoughts. And really, it's, it's an opportunity here. You've got a, a, a group of, of people up here who have, have been there and done that, and, and we can revisit some of the themes from, from earlier today as well. On the topic of augmented reality, we got into this a little bit in the video game panel with the discussion of Oculus Rift. And, and Peter, you guys at, at Microsoft Research have really gotten into this area in some respects, um, and I'm thinking in part of the Kinect as an augmentation of the body. But where do you see augmented reality? In other words, the overlaying of the digital world on the physical world. How quickly will that come, and, and how will it impact our lives and the businesses that many of the people in the room are running? Well, through, you know, we've been working really very in a focused way on two things. There, there is an infrastructure question, um, actually overlaying the real, the virtual, and the social. And I think that's a, actually it's something that's new that's emerged over the past couple of years, where concepts like um, pharmacovigilance, you know, where you actually not only understand something about the real and the virtual, but you also understand from a mining of news reports, from a mining of the Twitter sphere, that there may be uh, un previously unknown uh, interactions between drugs and things like that that directly affect you and overlay then uh, on, on how you live your life. All of that requires some amount of infrastructure in order to allow this overlay to happen. And we've been really working a lot of this stuff, and that's just so much fun. Um, I think you experienced um, at a recent summit that we held on our campus, um, the uh, Illuma Room uh, demo. And you know, it's hard to meet anyone that doesn't want to take that home. Um, yeah, this, this is a, the notion of having a projector on the side of the TV that essentially, as you're playing a video game, 
puts the environment that you're in onto the wall behind the TV. So it, you're, even though you're not actually interacting with that environment specifically, it creates uh, the context for, for the game that you're playing. Right, and people love to see their furniture get warped that way. <laughs> yes, um, it's, it's a step toward the holodeck in some ways, isn't it? It is, and it, it's something that just is so visceral and so primal in people. Um, that's going to create a pull, I think, for the basic infrastructure. But then apart from that, um, there is this kind of um, social aspect, this aspect where people come to expect a certain framework, a certain way of thinking about things. So when we started to take for granted that cars could be reliable and you wouldn't have to change, uh, let's say, a flat tire every 50 miles, it changed our framing and our changed the idea about what's possible and how we live our lives. And Part of what we look for are what are those inflection points? Uh, because sometimes those inflection points then tell you where is the puck going, what should we shoot for? And that ends up being a lot softer part of our research. Really, What, what do you mean by that? Uh, it's, these are parts of research where we start to get into anthropology, where we get into psychology, where we get into social science and economics. And looking for the intersection between that and where the infrastructure can head uh, ends up being just a super interesting and oftentimes um, surprising kind of research. So, so who on the panel plans to buy Google Glass? I, w I won't ask you, Peter, don't worry. <laughs> but I'm like, do you do? do? And, and, and what, what would be the primary applications that you could foresee? Is it just because, and would you just actually be, wear it in public? That's the other you question. You know, I, I, I don't know if I would wear it in public. I just want to play with it. Those guys are friends of ours, and uh, I think it would just be fun. And clearly, there are applications where it will be extremely useful, like doctors who are doing surgery and things like that. And, and um, um, you know, there are very interesting courtesy and privacy issues surrounding that. But hey, that's the world we live in now. But I would, I would buy it just because I'm a geek and yeah. like to play Same with there. stuff like that. But, and would you wear it out in public, Vern? Why not? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure I would. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I think there is a difference between uh, what Google Glass does and, and a lot of other things, the head-up display in your car and all kinds of things, is they make information available to you. What they can't do is manufacture attention, right? You can still only pay attention to one thing at a time. And uh, as you can tell from the uh, ads about texting and driving, you know, it's kind of important to focus on driving. But in my experience with head-up displays in, in uh, cars and planes is that it's a great way to find data or information that you're looking for quickly when you turn your attention to it, but you can't sit there and stare at it. Look, I, I, I have to say something. Um, so I love Google Glass. I, I probably will have, um, uh, have it myself. Um, and it, it, it seems to me that it has to be something that really does augment what we do. You know, we are so close now, uh, within a small number of years, of having a universal translator. So just imagine just having the augmentation uh, with the language barrier gone, and what that means for us in our social system, systems and in politics. Um, imagine just the simple things, like um, every time you take a picture, just from the ambient noise and discussion, it understands, oh, this was Mary's birthday party. These are things that all of this uh, wearable technology, I think, are going to give us. I cannot imagine a future where we aren't all drawn into that. And sure, there are going to be some uncomfortable moments for all of us who haven't grown up this way. Uh, but I don't think that's going to be true for the next generation. What about the smart watch? Um, you know, I, I actually I, I stopped wearing a watch. Jeremy, are you the only person with an actual watch? I haven't, yeah, I haven't seen a watch. It's, it, if you would have said 10 years ago that none of the people on this panel were wearing, a, were wearing a watch, you wouldn't have believed it. But there are signs that people are trying to bring it back. And one of my key questions on this is, will the smartphone be the hub for the watch if the watch actually happens? And Vern, this may be something that, that you could dive into because you know, in a lot of ways we're looking at the smartphone as the centerpiece of that which pulls in the connection and then connects to Bluetooth over the watch. Or will the watch itself actually have a cellular connection in it? Where, where are we headed on this front? I, I, I think it's a stratified situation. I think we're going to have many, many, many layers of network access that surround us. And we are able to pick and choose between them depending on what we are trying to do at any given time. I think the, uh, 
you know, we're talking about exploring space and helping the human race get out there. And thank you for that. I think it's incredible. But I'm still trying to help us all communicate here on this planet where we're still horribly interconnected. So I think, I think the, uh, the, to me, it's not that it's a thing. It's just one of many, many things that network together in our future lives. It, is it possible that we all might just have one antenna coming out the coming out our backs and? No, it, it's right here. It's right. It's right here. Temporal, it's right. And and then just one, one personal IP address. <laughs> I mean, is is that the way it works, or are we all going to have multiple antennas on our bodies? It, have you followed the the Indian social registry thing they're trying to do in India yes. now? Yes. And so you know, it's an IP address for everybody. Yeah. You know, they started trying to do with cell phones, and then some smart guy said, "Well, wait a minute. Why don't we just give everybody a, a URL?" Yeah. <laughs> You know, there is a, a, a point there, which is if you look ahead over the next, let's say, decade, the total proportion of computation that happens locally versus, say, in the cloud, I think is going to shift more locally because the bandwidth is going to become increasingly more uh, valuable. And I think that's something that, particularly in Silicon Valley, isn't completely grokked yet or internalized. Yeah, explain what you mean by that. I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. Well, as we move ahead, first of all, computing power will consume less power. So uh, the cost of uh, every joule, I think, will go down. Uh, the amount of computing power, the number of cycles that you can spend uh, per device uh, will go up. And the number of those devices that you have on your body uh, will go up. Um, but one thing that will remain expensive and maybe even increase in cost, both in terms of joules uh, and dollars, will be uh, the connectivity to the net. And so while everything will improve over time, if that improves more slowly, then as time goes on, the economics will, I believe, tend to drive the amount of local computation, local communi communication up. And, um, and that could have some consequences for how we organize our cloud systems, where we put the intelligence, um, how we wire things up. Okay, I want to throw it to John here in just a second. One, one last question, and it, you couldn't really have a discussion like this right now without a, a, a question about privacy. Um, so much of this innovation and the advances that we're going to see is enabled by data. And the f need for people, the users, to feel comfortable that the data they're supplying to these companies, either through their activities or explicitly, will be protected. To what extent did the NSA just completely screw everything up for the technology industry over the past six months? Go ahead, Eric. Uh, I think the whole NSA scandal is a really big deal. And I think that um, while there is always going to be a percentage of the population that you know, may, may cry a little bit about privacy, but fundamentally just wants to have the conveniences that, that being more open with, with your data uh, provides, I think there'll be a greater percentage of people who are just annoyed by it or have, you know, real concerns, and that's a great opportunity. You know, I think. In uh, what way? What do you mean by well, that? Well, I think there's uh, there's few companies out there right now and few products that are uh, targeting a market of uh, for which privacy and control over user data and control over all those parameters is really clearly easily provide it. And uh, I think you're going to see a lot more of that. Certainly, that's, uh, that's something that's very exciting for us. OK. So to what extent are you seeing this, Jeremy? Well, I, I, I think you have to have secure and everything. And I, and I think this is a political problem. I, don't, I, I think it's too hard to give up the advantages of ubiquitous data and your data going everywhere to say, oh, I'm just going to opt out. You can't opt out. And, and if you if you assume that everything you put up there can be read, um, you probably would opt out. So I, so I really think the right answer is more of a political solution to say you, you, you can't, the government cannot be doing that, or there has to be hard, hard limits on it. There has to be a sense of trust that my data is safe, both in the sense that you're using techniques that are, uh, that are supposed to protect your data and that the government is respecting that, except in maybe the most rare situation. I, to me, it's political. So, what's, so if the solution is political, is, is there a way in the meantime? Because, I mean, good luck yeah. <laughs> at this point for, with a political solution. I mean, is there a technology solution in the meantime? Eric's alluding to this a little bit. Well, um, oh, first of all, man, what a pisser. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, 
but trying to stay positive, <laughs> this situation, I have never seen uh, our researchers involved in security and privacy more motivated. Uh, in, in what way? To, I think everyone feels that there is something at risk here. And so if you are working in the security and privacy research space, uh, you feel some personal ownership of this issue and a personal motivation to develop solutions. And I think that that's good. In fact, historically in basic research, security and privacy have been among the harder to fund areas. You know, it's sort of like selling insurance. You know, do you shell, sell the really shiny augmented reality research or, or the boring get in your way security and privacy research? Um, things like this, I think, are starting to change that equation a little bit. Yeah. But my point about this is that if the security researchers develop some really hard to crack new technology and the NSA shows up on the door and says, we need a back door or we're going to throw you in jail, do you, what do you do? And that's where they've screwed it up. Right. So that's why I say it's a political problem. Yeah. Yeah. Good. John, let's, let's throw it yeah, out Yeah. Any questions out in the audience? A lot of great big topics. Uh, any questions here? Yeah, right here. I wanted to follow up with Peter about the connectivity bottleneck. I'm just curious to what extent that's a technical problem or, or whether it's a financial investment political bottleneck. Um, it's a, that's a great question. It's almost a physics problem. Um, and and uh, maybe Vern would be able to shed more light on that. Um, but the dependence on connectivity, for one thing, costs power. And that is something that is not improving as rapidly as all the other um, uh, kind of core technologies. And so that, to my way of thinking, is going to make that connectivity a more precious resource in the context of all of the computing that goes on around you. And so if you imagine increasing, let's say, by a factor of 1,000, the amount of computing that's, say, let's say, on your, on your clothing and on your body, um, it is not going to be the case for the energy and economic reasons to increase by that same factor your connectivity to the web. And so what has to happen? I think far, far more local computation and intelligence have to go on. If you take a, let's take a today example like um, a service like Shazam, you know, that can listen to ambient music. Right now, that is very connectivity dependent. You, you, Turn on Shazam, capture a few seconds of uh, audio, it goes to the cloud, analyzes the clip, and tells you what it is. The question is, if you have a thousand more of those services running on your body at all times, will that connectivity still be a practical uh, prospect? And I would argue no. Yeah, Vern, do you want to jump in on this yeah, one? Yeah, I'd love to. And I, I can, um, Peter, you've nailed it. Um, from, from where I sit, what it's time in history, the, the, the TCIP unicast internet has changed the world. And now though, that we look at 66% of all internet traffic is video, and if you look at the distribution of that video, we're getting about 90% of the downloads being generated by about 10% of the titles. And so I think it is a time in history where we need some architectural additions to the internet. We need to add a broadcast layer to the internet. And we need to do another thing that is probably not very popular in this room, but incredibly important, I think, is you know, we, we've, we, we have many reflexes, you know, server, client, server, client. And I think we're heading for a client shift over the next decade, because we cannot, without that connectivity, leverage the cloud for all of the wonders that it's delivering. So I'm, I'm a big believer in fog computing. And you get out of the cloud, and you put it all the way at the edge as much of it as you can. Nothing has decreased in cost more rapidly than storage. So what cost $1,000 a decade ago cost a dollar today. And as we get more and more capability to move you know, DRM uh, protected content, pre-cached at the edge, that most common stuff that we all want will start to be readily available, I think, and solve much free up much of the unicast capacity that we're struggling to find. That's great. Well, there's a lot to chew on here, and we've been going over some pretty high-level topics. Just as one rapid-fire last question, and I know you've got an important event to get to at the UW. Just check GeekWire later today. There's a big announcement coming at the UW that Peter's involved in. Um, 
just rapid fire here. If you could just bet on one technology for 2015, perhaps the, the technology that this panel will be discussing uh, in 2015 at the GeekWire Summit, w what would it be? What, what most excites you when you look two years out? And Vern, do you want to jump on this one? Metamaterials. Metamaterials, okay. And, and these are the uh, materials, the, the core technology in, in, in Kymeta's uh, beam steering broadband antennas. Yeah. It has a lot more applications than just in our antenna technology. Okay, good. How, how about you, Eric? I'm fascinated I'd have to, to say hear how knowledge you're processing. Knowledge the day, processing. The day everybody writes software. Okay, good. And Jeremy? You know, I kind of debate on this because I, I, I think about you know, sort of deep learning, the, the combination of machine learning and, and big data and all you can do. And that's that's been a long trajectory. and. Two years from now, it'll probably be just as exciting, if not more so than it is today. But the, but the thing that I actually get charged up about is this this um, kind of additive manufacturing, the, three, the extension of 3D printing into an industrial scale and the kinds of things that can be created with that. I think we're going to see a lot of that in the next few years. Yeah, that's great. Wow, I wish it didn't have to go last. Um, that, so let me go out on a limb. Um, and I don't know if we'll be talking about it here, but I think in 2015, there's a good chance that there will be a discovery in the quantum computing area that will win a Nobel Prize at some point. Very good, good. Well, Vern Fotheringham, Eric Anderson, Jeremy Jake, and Peter Lee, thank you very much for joining us.